Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We need to recognize it, to appreciate it, to know what it really is, and to see that that great love has made every provision. Help us, Lord, to take our eyes off of problems, to take our eyes off of things that you're not behind. Help us to know that you are in control. And though things don't always look good to our eyesight, and things don't always feel good here in this world, we know that your plan is perfect and there's going to be a world where none of these things exist. Help us, Lord, to learn what faithfulness is that we may know that Jesus' gift is truly ours. Bless us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, up until about two seconds ago, I wasn't sure what we should do today. <laughs> but as I look around, I think we're going to uh, resume what we have been doing with the Reformation through the life of Martin Luther. Now, we went initially through a little bit of the history of the world to show the miserable world that existed the two or three hundred years before the 1500s. A world of total ignorance. A world of people thinking religion was those drunken priests. A world, well, I can't say more than total ignorance. Poor, poor people beat down by rich people. And you know, I think the world's trying to get back there again. <laughs> I think by the same people. For the same reasons. And as hard as they are trying to get there, maybe we ought to try to get to where God wants us to go. <laughs> and see what He did. What did He do? Did God do anything for two or three hundred years before Luther came along? Yeah, what did He do? Well, He got the people to read Him books. <laughs> Pagans, yeah, but that was a start. <laughs> and then he got some of the really bright ones who learned how to read books to read Greek and Hebrew and bring back the ancient really good writers. And the people started reading and saying, you know, that's not, not like anything we know. That's a different world. Where did that one come from? And the more they thought about it, the more they started talking to each other. They started realizing, we don't have to live like this. We just don't have to live like this. And so the more people talk to each other, the more... I hate to make this connection because I think the devil is in the modern one. But do you know Mubarak is gone? Why? Why? What army took him down? What rifles? What tanks? What airplanes took him down? It was the web. <laughs> the computer took him down. Does that say anything to you? People looking at a computer, talking to each other on the computer, and he's gone after all those years of an absolute rulership. And he still probably doesn't know what happened. <laughs> well, you know what happened? People started talking to each other. And when enough of them were saying the same thing... <laughs> That's an idea whose time has come, and you can't stop an idea whose time has come. That's what God is waiting for us to do, is to get His idea out, so the time will come. And as long as we just sit around and don't do it, it's not going to happen. At least not as far as we're concerned. <laughs> God's going to get it to happen, do you know that? with or without us. Now, that's kind of scary, isn't it? 
with or without us, he's going to get this done. And you know, we as Seventh-day Adventists have said for a long time, oh, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And we've become almost like parrots. What do you mean Jesus is coming? What do you see that says Jesus is coming? Well, the time is closing up. Well, that's true. But is anybody going to blame us for Jesus coming? <laughs> so I have told people through the years, and you know, I'm just like everybody else. I have to keep understanding it, believing it, working with it, because the human being doesn't care. So he's coming. That's his job. I have nothing to do with it. Well, yes, you do. Here's what I've said to people through the years. Ready or not, he's coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Ready or not. That ought to stir us. Well, at the time of the Reformation... Jesus said, ready or not, we're going to do a reformation. And so he was building it, and the people were talking to each other, and the Mubaraks were starting to shake. The whole Catholic Church began to notice something's wrong here. We say something to these people, and they're laughing at us now. <laughs> and the people said, you know, there's got to be something more. We don't know what it is. There's got to be something more than these priests. There's got to be something more. Well, we're not going to review that whole thing, but you know that God brought up a John Reuchlin, a brilliant man who conquered the Greek and, and could speak it so well that a real Greek person, when he heard him, said, oh, these barbarous Germans, Greece has moved over here. <laughs> And he had a nephew. You remember who his nephew was? Yeah. Philip. <laughs> Schwarzerd. And the intellectuals of that time didn't like ugly names, so they always took a new name. And his new name was Melanchthon. Okay? So Philip Melanchthon was the nephew of the man who brought back Greek. And he wrote a Hebrew grammar. And he began putting down the monks saying, you know, that ignorance isn't going to help anybody. We need to know these things. We need to get back to true knowledge. Now, I want you to hold on to that word. True. True. Are you interested in the truth? I mean, really interested in the truth. When I was talking to a couple of Mormon fellows recently, I found a little cartoon in the paper. There's two fellows with a signpost. And on the signpost, it, it said, Truth. T-R-O-O-T-H. <laughs> Truth. And at the bottom it says, Close enough. Let's go. And I handed it to the fellows, and they both laughed. Oh, they really thought that was funny. Truth, close enough. I said, yeah, isn't that funny? Close enough. <laughs> and they looked at me. <laughs> it woke them up. Mm -hmm. I said, are you close enough? Is that good enough, T-R-O-O-T-H, or do you want the real thing? And so we... We have the Bible, King James they had. They're doing better than some of us. They had the King James Bible. And it says, we have the Bible. I said, yeah, have you read it? Have you read it? And I said, well, we have it marked. I said, yeah, you mark what they tell you to mark. Have you read it? Do you know what it says? And they thought about it for a minute. So they decided to test me, and they started quoting scriptures at me. And I told them what the scriptures said without opening the Bible, and they're wondering what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, I have read it. I don't know every word in there, but I know enough to know when somebody's not telling me the right thing. 
I said, until you get there, I don't think you should say you have the Bible. You only carry it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I talked straight to them like I talked to everybody. You know what? They didn't get upset one time with me. Because I wasn't telling them something that wasn't right there in front. <laughs> I believe in tact, but not when it's called chicken. Okay? That's what most people call tact. They're chicken. They're yellow. <laughs> All right. So Martin Luther, when he came along, what had God been doing? He prepared a whole world. All of Europe was ready for something. The people were agitated. They were being educated. The princes, the rulers were no longer afraid of the system. The emperor himself was having a problem. The language boiled down to one place for the whole world again. The whole reformed world, that is, in Germany, then it goes to France, Scandinavia, over there in England. But God is making that same preparation today because what he did in Luther's time, the Jesuits came along and ruined. You mean it didn't work? That's exactly what I'm saying. There are some people that have this fairy tale idea that if God does something, it's total success. And if it goes wrong, that's not the way he does it. We are human beings with freedom to think and to make decisions. And he's not going to force anybody to do it his way. No one. That's a choice. And what a fantastic choice it is for us to make. And it's such a... So, such a tremendous thing that he doesn't tell us to make it one time. <laughs> Every day, the choice. And maybe not once a day, maybe every ten seconds. <laughs> the choice. The choice. The glory of God or my self-indulgence. When Jesus said, follow me, he didn't mean, there's my footsteps, go ahead, go where I go. That's not what he meant. When he said, follow me, he meant, I started in heaven as God. And I left it all behind to help you. Follow me. You leave all of your things behind and help somebody. No selfishness in your life, just like me. Well, the world was unlike that in Martin Luther's time. It wasn't like that at all. So, Martin Luther, let's look at him for a moment to review. Where was he born? Yeah. A poor man and a poor woman living in a poor town. Did you hear that someplace before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how God does it. He didn't start out with a millionaire's son. Didn't start out with a... Oh, I almost started saying some political names. I better not say that. Uh... He started out with something very poor because that's the way God does it. A little teeny seed, a big tree. <laughs> and so Martin Luther was born to a family that their living was made chopping down trees and oh. selling the wood. Oh. That's all they knew how to do. <laughs> That's all the resources they had. A tree. Go cut it down. Sell it to somebody. Later, not much later, his father moved to a mining town. And he 
eventually got a couple of smelters and he started making money that way. He still was poor, but he was dignified. It was steady. Martin Luther showed he was pretty smart very early, so they started sending him to school. And little by little, everybody who was around him realized this, this is a genius. He doesn't forget anything he reads. <laughs> he, can, he, he, just, he knows everything he's ever seen or heard. <laughs> this is total recall. And I had the idea he was funny. The, they don't come out and say it, but he had a sense of humor. You can find it in his writings. A sense of humor. This man could see both sides of things. He could cut up. Not as a clown, but with an ironic twist. He was sharp. So we're, we're getting up to the place now right after he was converted. Do you remember how he was converted? He, he almost died four times, and each time he knew, I can't die, I'm not ready to die. <laughs> how can I see God in the condition I'm in? And it terrified him. And here he was with a master's degree. They sent him to Rome. You remember that was our last time we were together. Mm -hmm. They sent him to Rome. And he, when he went there, oh, oh, heaven on earth, the pinnacle of Christianity, Rome. And when he was at the outskirts, he knelt down and said, Rome, I salute thee. And he got up and went into Rome. What did he find? <laughs> now Luther was used to sleeping in a little cell with no furniture in it. And his only food was bread and herrings. That's what he ate. And he saw the big shots eating Steaks and potatoes and cakes and pies. <laughs> All the goodies. With these fancy chairs and beautiful tables with gold on their walls and <laughs> fancy clothes. And Luther couldn't take it. This is nothing I've ever seen before. This, this is against... God. And so now we have caught up. This is how far we have gone so far. We are now going to begin looking at the Reformation in Luther so we can look at the Reformation that God used him to spark. All right. So Luther has left Rome. And he's totally disgusted with what he saw there. But you know, he came away with something. He couldn't have gotten, I don't think, another way. He has now permanently set God in the place of the priest. And the people didn't know that, but Luther did now. <laughs> Here is where it's beginning in him. No more priests, including the Pope. Now, he hasn't made the moves away yet. He's still a Catholic. Yeah, he's still a good Catholic, quote, unquote. But he knows now God is above all of this. Well, as he resumes his duties now as a professor at Wittenberg, Staupitz, you remember the name Staupitz? He's the vicar general of all of Germany. He is the close friend of Frederick the Wise, the elector. And Staupitz is a Christian, remember. He believes in justification through faith in the merits of Jesus. And he's the first one that told Martin Luther about it. Stop it. He's watching Luther very carefully because he knows this man is different. 
He's not like the other priests. And so Stapitz is talking to Frederick. He says, you know, we, we can't just let him be another monk, even if he's at Wittenberg. We cannot let him be just another monk. And Frederick was catching on to this. He knew that when Luther stood up to preach, the people listened to him because he was not droning and saying just words. He was saying things they've never heard before. And the people were tuned in and they were, they were really understanding. And Frederick said, you know, you're right. We can't let him be just another professor in a college. So they decided something together. He must be a doctor of divinity. <laughs> a doctor of the Bible. And so Stoppitz went over there to talk to him and he got him off in a private corner and he said, you know, you, uh, you are languishing here and we don't want that. We think you should become a doctor of divinity. And Luther about fell down. He said, what? A doctor of the Bible? Not me. <laughs> Not me. You pick somebody else. And stop. He said, well, what do you mean pick some, somebody else? We want you to be a doctor of divinity. He said, no, that honor is too high. I'm just nothing. You can't make me do that one. And stop. I said, well, you know, the elector and I have talked about this. We want you to do this and to teach her as a doctor of divinity. And Luther kept making excuses and saying one thing after another, but Stoppitz was not letting go. <laughs> and finally Luther said, well, I can't afford it. I can't pay for a doctor of divinity program. <laughs> Stoppitz said, it's paid for. <laughs> he says, well, I can't do it. I can't do it. Stoppish looked at him and said, Your order is commanding you to take the doctor of divinity. And I am telling you to take the doctor of divinity. You are to obey us. <laughs> now, he was an argument he couldn't do anything with. <laughs> he vowed to obey them. <laughs> I said, well, okay. <laughs> now then, Luther, after he had made his decision, we need to know one other little thing here because there are bits of the story we have not talked about yet. And they become important later if there's a later for us. I'm not sure. This church is getting very busy. <laughs> All right. There was a fellow who was the head of the theology department, we'll call it that, the Bible department at Wittenberg. And the people who talked about him later in history called him ABC, <laughs> which wasn't very nice. You know, ABC is always the beginning of things. <laughs> But he's the head of the university, uh, the head of the university Bible department, and his name was Andrew Budenstein, and he was born at Karlstadt. Andrew Budenstein from Karlstadt, A B C. At least in English, it's A B C. I don't know for sure how they got to A B C. It's a K in German. But uh, does the name Carl Stott say anything to you yet? It's going to say a whole lot before we're done here. Because Carl Stott became one of the really effective disruptors of the Reformation. He trained Martin Luther. And he is known in history as Karlstadt. Okay? We'll get to him as we go on further. I just want to introduce him now because Luther is taking the doctor of divinity under him. And Karlstadt recognized 
the genius in this man. So, oh, you can't put him fr- enough in front of him. You remember last time we talked about all the different jobs they kept giving Luther? All the different things he was doing at the same time? Luther just gobbled up everything. And Karl Stott recognized it. And sometime later, we'll bump into the statement. He says, I will not be less than Martin Luther. (laughs) He knew. He knew. Well, in 1512, in the summer, Luther started his program. By October of 1512, they had to give him his doctor's degree. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's got to tell you something. (laughs) Doctor Martin Luther teaching Bible at Wittenberg. So, he has come a long way. But you know, Luther made an oath. I don't know how many people know about this oath, but he made an oath, a vow to God. It was about the Bible. Now, when I say the Bible, what am I saying? Am I saying the NIV? Am I saying the RSV? Am I saying the NASV? Am I saying the Jesuit Bible? Am I saying the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses? When I say Bible, and when the history said Bible, what does that mean? It only means one thing. The received text as it came from the apostles. None of these other things I just mentioned because they do not come from the apostles. They all come from the same place. The same place that the Jesuits got theirs. Now you maybe never heard it that straight, but that's the way it comes down historically and I can prove that. Straight line and I can show it to you in the spirit of prophecy. The Bible, the Word of God, the only infallible authority, the Word through the apostles in a straight line through the Walden Seas. And we will show the history before long. Luther said, the Bible... Is my only authority, the Word of God. And he says, the apostles and the prophets. He knew exactly what he was saying. Because there would have been no reformation without returning to the Word of God. The world already had torn up Bibles. Yes, in the time of Luther, there were all kinds of them. And they started way back with Origen, then the Vulgate, Jerome, then Constantine's 50 Bibles, of which Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were two, of which all the scholars in the world rely upon. All, I said, out of which the Greek Nestle text came from, which is the authority of the Greek in today's world of scholarship, which is a false Greek. Luther had none of that. The Bible, the true Word of God. And he translated, later we'll get to it, that true Bible into the German 
And that German Bible of Luther still exists today and it reads the same way as the King James. I don't know why there are certain scholars who can't see these simple facts today. You know how I began to think about that? My wife speaks and reads German. Among other things. <laughs> she went to school and after one year of German, she could talk better German than a teacher could. <laughs> She's another gobbler. <laughs> she speaks German. And she has a library of German books. And one day I was looking at the titles and I noticed I said, wait a minute, what do we have here? I pulled it out. It was Luther's German Bible. Really? I said, read me some of this. And so she read some to me. And I don't speak German, but I know certain German words in the Bible. You can't study theology without knowing a little bit of German, some Greek, some Hebrew, some Latin. Some, you have to know a little bit to get your way through and so when she began to read, I said, wait a minute. I found another book. Desire of Ages. In German. <laughs> I said, here, read me this page. The Desire of Ages in, in German is, the, is Luther's German Bible, the received text. There isn't one modern version text in that Bible. The desire of ages in the German language is the received text text, the apostolic Bible. It's only in the English language that all the new versions have crept in. Right. Remember I talked about my concern about you can go to the ABC right now and I'll show you books that have the NASB in them. I mean Desire Ages books. Now you know Ellen White never put those in there. The NIV in Desire of Ages? Well, she didn't do that one either. The RV? Well, I'm not too sure who put those in yet. I'm, I'm tracking it down. But what I'm saying is this. Martin Luther, when he took his oath, when he vowed to teach the Word of God, he was talking about the apostolic text, not the Catholic text. This is the man God picked to start the Reformation. A man who believes his word. So he's now a doctor. He promised to preach the word of God faithfully. To teach the word of God in purity. To study the Bible his whole life. To defend the Bible against all false teachers. Now there's a man who loves the truth. Mm -hmm. Don't just sit around and let people run all over the place with their falsehoods. Hey, you have to defend the Word of God. Last time we said something, I think our brother Ken here caught it just like that. John 5, 39. In the King James it says, Search the Scriptures. Now you just see, if you ever hear anybody preaching that verse, if they don't say, you search the Scriptures and in them you think that you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. The Word of God doesn't say that. That's only in the modern versions. Well, what's the difference? 
Well, I'll tell you what the difference is. Fifty times Ellen White says, Jesus commanded them to search the Scriptures. Now, are we going to believe Ellen White or are we going to believe these modern versions? Jesus commanded them, search the Scriptures. He did not say, oh, well, you're reading them, that's fine, but you're missing the point. He did not say that. That's a whole different idea. And it was invented by the Jesuits, and it now sits in all these modern versions. Every one of them has the Jesuit version in their book. Every one of them. Including the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, that's pretty good company, isn't it? <laughs> this was Luther's oath. When he made that oath, this is Luther, something coming out of him. His call to the Reformation. No false church or false teaching can stand up to that because that's God talking. The pure Word. You know, we're talking about Reformation right now and I hope somebody gets the idea of what a Reformation really is. It's getting back to the true Word of God. When this church starts seeing what those books are and throwing them out, then we'll be headed towards a reformation. Now, when I say that, I don't say they have no value because there are some good things in these books here and there. But they are not the Word of God. They have too many problems to be the Word of God. The Word of God is the received text from the apostles and you don't change it. Let me read you that one. I thought it was interesting that Daubigny came up with something here. It says, called, I'm sorry, by imposing on his conscience the holy obligation of searching freely and boldly, proclaiming the Christian truth. This oath raised the new doctor above the narrow limits to which his monastic vow would perhaps have confined him. Called by the university, by his sovereign, in the name of the imperial majesty and of the sea of Rome itself, and bound before God by the most solemn oath, he became from that hour the most in trepid herald of the word of life. They didn't know what they created. <laughs> Later on, he says, you're trying to shut me down. You forced me to become a doctor. I didn't want to become a doctor. <laughs> you forced me. And nobody can take it back now. If God doesn't want me to be one, He's going to have to put me down. <laughs> you know, that should have been us, every one of us, the day of our baptism. Somebody should have told us, you are now a champion of Jesus Christ. You're part of His glorious kingdom to promote His cause forever. Don't you ever slow down. Who talked to you like that? <laughs> well, well, I'm not the, this is not the day of your baptism. Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> you know what happened? Except for people who are fifth generation, seventh day Adventists, maybe. I don't know. When we were baptized on that day, were you planning to sin on that day? No. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Nobody does that. That's, that's a pretty high day. And you're saying, oh, oh, I want to please God. I want to please God. And you got a hold of yourself and you said, I'm disciplined. 
today. <laughs> today, I'm giving everything. Today is baptism day. And you know what? I can tell you, you pleased God. <laughs> you did. It can't be any other way. You pleased God. Why? Because you wanted to, and he accepted that in Jesus Christ. Through his merits, he said, I am well pleased with you. Now, what happened a month later? I'm going to tell you the horrible truth. You looked at some other Seventh-day Adventists. And the standard went down. You thought you had joined the camp of the saints. But now you hear Adventists laughing at Johnny Carson. And I said Adventists. I did not say Seventh-day Adventists because Seventh-day Adventists don't do that. But Adventists do. I hope you know the difference. Can you imagine Paul sitting around laughing at whatever? I don't even know who's out there. Can you see him doing that? Paul, the disciple, the apostle, the Holy One of God, who only thinks life and death. You're never going to see Martin Luther doing that either. There's no way that the reformer of the church could sit around listening to the devil's things and, and enjoying it. He knew better. He was a champion of the real Word of God. The true, pure, holy, infallible Word of God. Do you know in the new translations the word infallible has been taken out? Yeah, it's gone. They took the word infallible out of the Bible. They don't like that word. Here's what Luther said. The Christians receive no other doctrines than those founded on the express words of Jesus Christ, of the apostles and of the prophets. No assembly of doctors has a right to prescribe new ones. You know, I think some of us ought to be at least as good as Martin Luther because we had more light than he had. Oh, he was a mighty man. He was a reformer. What he did, very few individuals can do. I mean, God picked him to do it. <laughs> Gave him the power. But we should know what Martin Luther knew. No group of scholars has the right to make new words in the Word of God. Ellen White says the same thing, and yet I've had ministers tell me she doesn't speak on this subject. Come on! She has a lot to say about this subject. But I don't want to change the, where we're going here. We're trying to understand the Reformation and what made it the power it was back then and then didn't get completed. We have to have at least 
that much power again and then finish it. And we are nowhere near what those people were. You know what they did to the Walden Seas, the Albigen Seas, the Huguenel? Yeah, they chased them all over the mountains. They were trying to live a peaceful life and go out and evangelize. They chased them all over. And when they caught them, they cut them into pieces. Did they stop doing what they were doing? How many of us have been cut into pieces? You know, the biggest favor God could do to us is put us in a place where somebody's chasing us. No new ones. Let me, let me just throw one out here. In the book of James, it says, Confess your faults one to another. And the Greek word in the received text is definitely, in the received text, is definitely false. In the Nestle text, I looked it up the other day just to be sure I wasn't making some of this up. In the Nestle text, the Greek word is confess your hamartia to us. And the word hamartia in the Greek means sin. Every time. So the Nestle text has changed the Greek that everybody studies to get to the true meaning of the Bible to hamartia, which now comes out, confess your sins to one another. And in my reading of great controversy, she says, when a man confesses his sins to another being, that is man degraded to the lowest. That's where the Catholic gets confession from. Right. That text. Right. And all the new versions have that Catholic text in their Bible. That way, confess your sins. Now, I just am alarmed that many of our ministers don't recognize all these things when they're reading through and say, well, that's not what it says. How come they don't say it? And it's not like it's not there. I mean, as I mentioned before, I can show you 5,700 new ones that they put in the modern versions. There would have been no reformation if these new versions had existed in the days of Luther. And there's not going to be one in our church as long as we're preaching out of them. I'm sorry. That's right. I'll say that to any minister, anyone who wants to know where did I get that from, I uh, will tell him it wasn't from the seminary. I went there too. Some things have to be said very straight or nobody's going to listen. I was talking to a minister a little while ago. It's been about maybe three months ago now. And when I said a few of these things to him to try to get him to understand there's an issue here we need to look at, he looked at me and he said, Alex, you're the most credible person I've ever heard saying any of this. You know what that told me? Everybody else that says it is a dummy. Yeah. Because that, that's exactly what he was taught. Only ignorant people believed in the received text. Only ignorant people believe the Erasmus text is a pure Greek text. We haven't talked much about Erasmus yet. But in 1516, Erasmus comes along and he publishes the first Greek text from the received text of the Apostles. Erasmus. Today you can ask any scholar anywhere and they will tell you the Erasmus text is no good. It's full of error. 
On page 64 of Great Controversy, Ellen White tells us, it is the pure text that Erasmus gave back to the church. Who are we going to believe? Who are we going to believe? You line up all the scholars in this whole world and line them up against Ellen White. And you can just guess who I'm going to believe. Now I grant you, most of the people who are deceived are deceived. They don't know there's a problem. <laughs> And there is such a thing as honest deception. Okay? I don't believe a person is wicked because they're deceived. I don't think they're a hopeless cause because they are deceived. They are deceived and they can be brought out of it if they'll listen. All right, so let's continue here. Remember, we are studying the Reformation from the point of view of Luther's life because we see how it really works in his life. And if somebody is trying to do something different from what happened in his life and then in history in the church, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Truth. The Word of God. Supreme authority in your life. Uh, what I, uh, did I add something? <laughs> Supreme authority in your life. That's what Luther had. So Luther said, if the, if the emperor made me a doctor, if the pope made me a doctor, if my order made me a doctor, then I am a doctor because they forced me to be one. I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> They're going to get the Word of God. <laughs> and there it is. He says, he says, there's nothing else can be done. His will be done. Now, I'm reminding you, this is all before he stood up with those theses. We haven't arrived there yet. It's still building. It's still coming. He says, I am determined. I have vowed. I am determined in God's name to tread on lions, to tread on dragons, to tread on snakes. I will put serpents underfoot. I will do it all during my life. And I will do it more after I'm dead. Oh. I hope you're beginning to appreciate a little bit more about this Rob German. <laughs> He's not what the history books say. You've got to read him to find out who he is. Oh, he was a human just like any of us here. He had things that he didn't have quite understood. Yeah, he had some weaknesses. But we're not going to heaven because we were so busy doing our weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. We've got to find out what God wants us to do and then do it because he never tells us to do something without giving us the power to do it. Never. It's simple. If you hear him, he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> Seven times in Revelation, right? <laughs> he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's all there is to it. What's there to talk about? <laughs> Are you going to say, well, God, uh, don't you mean something else? <laughs> Oh, uh, God, uh, maybe you mean somebody else. <laughs> no, no, no. God does not stutter. I discovered that a long time ago. He means exactly what he says, and he doesn't have to say it twice. He's not going to change it, no matter what we think about it. 
Luther understood it. He heard it. He made his vow. He said, that's me my whole life now. That's me. And he knew what that meant. He knew what that meant. Do you think he didn't know who Rome was? <laughs> he knew exactly what it meant. He also knew they can come after me with a million soldiers. They can't touch me if God wants me to do something. And so Luther developed something else. He began to have a love for the church. Not Rome. For the real church of the Bible. And something was developing in him. One time, at a meeting with a lot of big shots, he said, the corruption of the world originated in the priest's teachings. That's what's wrong with this world. The ministry. Did I say that? Ministers teach that the law of God has been done away with. Do they teach that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what do you tell a person after you tell them God's law doesn't exist anymore? What good is man's law? Right. So what? Right. You have just taught people to be anarchists. And if you do it on blogs, oh, you can take down a man like Mubarak. Mm -hmm. You don't have to guess anymore what's coming. It's in the newspapers. You want this whole world to hate Seventh-day Adventists? Get it on the computer. It'll take six hours. And there will be a ready-made mob looking for you. The pure Word of God. That's what Luther was all about. So he began preaching the pure Word of God. And immediately he saw two things happening at the university level. Aristotle was going down. And that's what everybody believed until then. Aristotle. Thomas Aquinas going down. Augustine in the city of God coming up because he taught some things that Luther was teaching also at that time. <coughs> and so he began to say, we've got to stop all these useless studies. Now, don't you think that's a good thing to say? All these useless. Maybe we could say it differently in our time. Maybe we could stop our useless hours in front of entertainment. <laughs> And I had to say entertainment because entertainment covers more than... <laughs> I don't want to get into that side of things right now. There's so many things happening. Luther at this time, as he was studying, began to appreciate what John Roycland had done in the Greek, in the Hebrew, and the Latin. And he took his side on things now because Reichland was attacking the priests. And Luther said, well, this man really knows things and he studied the right places. So he took the side of Reichland and he took the side of Erasmus. That's a, a different story once we get into it about he and Erasmus. You see, Erasmus was as smart as any Christian in the world at that time. He was brilliant. What a mind. An absolute genius. He was another one of those that never forgot anything and then could write it down. <laughs> and Luther recognized in him that kind of a mentality. But Erasmus never became a Christian. Yeah. And although God used him in a tremendous way to give Christians a true Bible in the Greek language, he himself never understood 
the righteousness of Christ in the life. He never understood courage. He never understood liberty to be bold. He was a coward. <laughs> a brilliant coward. But he was a coward. <laughs> you know what he wanted to save? It wasn't the world. It wasn't the church. It wasn't... You know what he wanted to save. <laughs> Himself. He was just a little guy. But he dominated a room wherever he went. He was just a mental giant. The kings of this earth wanted him to come over and live with them. And he turned all of them down. Well, we're not talking about Erasmus yet. Let's, let's continue here. Spolotno is another very interesting man. Maybe we shouldn't get into him right now. We have, uh, let's see, is that clock right? Okay, we have a few minutes here. I want to continue into another area here. While the academics were fighting with each other, Luther wouldn't go over there. He was going to teach the Bible. And he said this. I'm going to use Daubigny's word here. He had a living faith in Christ. Does that say anything to you? A living faith. You know what a, a non-believing faith is? A non-living faith is a person that says, I believe. I don't care what you believe. What are you doing? That's what you believe. <laughs> okay. He had a living faith every minute of his life. What did that living faith show itself? He says, within my heart, reigns alone faith in my Lord Jesus Christ, who is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all the thoughts that occupy my mind all the day. Did you know that's how Christians talk? Yeah. I can show it to you in the spirit of prophecy. Within my heart, Jesus has my thoughts all the day, the beginning, the middle, the end, all the time. That's called the glory of God. Didn't Paul say it? Whatever you do, whatever you drink, whatever you eat, do all to the glory of God. <laughs> That's what Luther just said. This is my life. It's the only life I know now. I had the privilege to talk to H.M.S. Richards a few times. He was a real man. When he first started out, he knew he, he wanted to do something for God. I don't know how much you know about him. Maybe I should say just a couple words. When he was growing up as a boy, he couldn't talk. He was a stutterer. <laughs> he just could not talk. And he said, I want to be a preacher. <laughs> and people would look at him and say, you can't be a preacher. <laughs> Preachers don't stutter. <laughs> he said, I want to be a preacher. <laughs> I want to be a preacher. <laughs> so he said, how can I be a preacher? I said, you foolish boy. Well, if you want to be a preacher, preach. <laughs> okay. Where can I preach? Well, there's no church that's going to let you preach. Just go find some place to preach. Well, he lived in Los Angeles. 
So he found himself a corner in Los Angeles. He put up a little box and he started to preach. <laughs> That's who HMS Richards is. That mighty preacher, I don't know if there's been an equal to him in the Seventh Adventist Church since the time of Alan White and those people. I don't know. I'm not saying he's the greatest. I'm just saying I don't know. That man was a preacher because he did not preach. He didn't go home at night and pull out a book and say, well, there's a good quote. There's a good quote. That man preached out of himself when he first started on the radio. He set himself up in his garage in Glendale. A little garage.